So the um, thing I'd like to start out with is uh, just get your observations on uh, Intel's ability to, uh, to identify future trends and really capitalize on them uh, before they had become obvious uh, movements within the industry uh, versus being able to jump on a bandwagon that has already started and out, out executing somebody who may have already established a lead there. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested in your observations as to whether that was an accurate uh, perception and uh, to, to the extent that it was, uh, what within the Intel culture or whatever might uh, contribute to that? Yeah, you know, I'll give three different observations on that. One is I actually give Intel a little bit more credit uh, on the PC right situation, right? In the sense that you know the uh, you know the crush campaign, as it was described at the time, was go get design wins everywhere. Mm -hmm. We know we're not going to be able to necessarily predict the future, so plant as many seeds as possible, mm -hmm. right? And one of them just happened to be the PC, right? <laughs> you know, and the IBM design win, but you know many of those other designs actually came to fruition and became embedded businesses and other things associated with it. So I think there was actually a deep realization that hmm, you know we're onto something big and we're not going to be able to predict necessarily what circuitous route it may or may not play in the marketplace. So I actually give them some credit in that regard that they sort of realize that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'll say first observation is that some of that, you know, that's the way things go, right? You know, you know could you predict the impact of an open, you know, computer arch architecture ecosystem at this radically different price point in the era of mini computers and so on? Ah, I, I think that was actually a pretty thoughtful way to go about market creation. The you know, second observation I make is market creation is just bloody hard, mm -hmm. right? You know, and being able to predict the future, you know, and how many companies over time have successfully created major new industries. Very few, right? And if you add, you know, those up over time, obviously we give Apple credit, right? You know, being able to, under Steve's leadership, create industry-defining products. But the ability for any one company to have multiple industry-defining, creating, you know, product categories is very rare. You know, and in fact, right, you know, one of the things, and you know, as we t we'll get on to the, int uh, from the Intel story to the VMware story in a little bit, but you know, some of what I'm proud of at VMware is we're actually being able to successfully do organic as well as inorganic innovation. Which leads me to the third observation, is that you know, Intel's been bad at inorganic, mm -hmm. right? You know, its ability to acquire right, disruptive technologies and be able to accelerate and bring them forward is actually something that the very strong culture of Intel, right, boom, this is how you do it, this is, you know, how we do innovation, this is how we scale and manufacture and so on, actually creates a whole lot of antibodies, mm -hmm. you know, to bring in these other disruptive forces. Because, you know, one of the magics about Silicon Valley has always been, you know, any idea has 10 different startup companies that are trying to do it in, you know, many different ways and, you know, timing and so on, you know, bringing that forward in the right way. So one of the things that, you know, I'd say is, and I, and I learned this in the painful way of not being successful at Intel, is how do you go bring a creative startup company and be able to curate it you know, without crushing it inside of a big major company. And that's something, you know, that Intel wasn't successful at. And I think that limited some of that ability to do it because some ideas you're gonna have, but you know, if you, if you invest in one or two teams to go do an idea, you know that in the industry there's 10 or 20. Right? And to be able to predict that you have the best one who has just the right combination of go-to-market, core technology, gets the product just right, you know, you're usually betting against the odds. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you really need to be able to do both organic and inorganic. And Intel's strong culture also created, made a, creates many of the antibodies that prevented them from being successful at inorganic acquisitions and making those successful as well. And as I participated in a number of that, though, those experiences as well, I sort of learned many things about how not to do it uh, also in that regard. And in a very powerful culture like Intel, it's really going against the cultural model that they have in place. So it's, you know, the, the problem you describe in terms of doing new things within a well-established company is a problem that most, the vast majority of large companies yeah. have. So can you describe just one of those experiences and what you learned? What was the, could it have been successful or was just no way that that was ever going to work? Uh, mm -hmm. Or could you have done it in a better way? And, 
and been more successful. Yeah, you know, and I remember my first acquisition that I was personally responsible for at Intel was Chips and Technologies, mm -hmm. right? When we acquired that, you know, that was, you know, being part of the chipset uh, company. And, you know, I personally oversaw that acquisition, bringing it in, you know, making it part of the uh, uh, Intel chipset business at the time. And, you know, it was a 2D graphics capability in particular was what we were looking for. Um, you know, it was 3D was starting to emerge, but 2D graphics, we didn't have that. And, you know, I'll say, you know, personally looking back on it versus what I know now, you know, if there are 10 things to do about making an inorganic acquisition successful, you know, I think I broke nine out of the 10 rules, right? <laughs> you know, just, you know, there just wasn't, right? You know, I mean, you know, how do you make sure you keep that team well separated? You know, how do you make sure you have the leadership? How do you, you know, allow their vision to fit into yours? You know, force as many of those organizational barriers, right, uh, off the table. Minimize the GNA burden, right, that you're bringing on the new entity, right? You know, many of those kind of things, if you're going to bring, right, the successful company into, the, uh, into this larger structure that, you know, if you crush the spirit, the vision, the innovation engine that you have uh, inside of it, you don't get anything on the other side of the integration process. Mm -hmm. And you know, seeing that play out on a number of occasions, right? It's sort of like, wow, you know, we can't do that. And you know, like Intel, some of the communications companies, boom, let's get them onto our process technology. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, now you're essentially telling them to re-engineer onto the Intel process technology because you know, part of the synergy case was get the fab synergy. Right, get the cost of wafers, get that thing. Yeah. You know, now you're going to from essentially a, something that was cultured for a communications process technology and forcing it onto a digital process, mm -hmm. right? Hmm, it doesn't quite fit. We don't have the libraries, a lot of re-engineering, so immediately you're sort of putting yourself off the curve of that piece of the industry. Mm -hmm. And so boy, you know, so essentially you're sort of miss you quickly miss a generation, you know, you miss a Wi-Fi generation, you miss you know, one of the uh, uh, process improvement cycles that they might have gotten if they remained on TSMC. But, oh, we can't be on TSMC. We're, you know, in, we're Intel, the mighty, you know, process company. So in every one of those hurdles that you put one of those companies through creates this barrier for success inside of a mighty, powerful, culture-driven company like uh, uh, Intel. So I've lear learned a lot in that process. Unfortunately, many of those weren't all that successful for Intel. And uh, the communications area is one in particular that I think you know, Intel threw, threw itself at harder than most. And for the most part, it wasn't successful over a long period of time and billions of dollars uh, invested in many of those acquisitions. Okay. May I ask a follow-up question yeah, to please that do. one? It, it, um, with these kind of... Uh, characterizations of Intel, I always think there's such an easy counter argument that could be made. And I wanted to see if you think it's baloney or if it holds, <laughs> holds water, which is that you can just flip the whole thing around and say, focus is important. Um, w w by focusing on the Intel architecture, you know, in microprocessors of all varieties and with um, you know, a, a kind of um, synergistic memory business, what you see is uh, record revenue and profit mm -hmm. over and over and over again to the present time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in some ways, that if, if you're looking at it in terms of revenue and profit, Intel is following a, a highly successful strategy. Yeah, um, and I think, by the way, you know, there's value to that, and I think that's almost a cultural statement. You know, why have they succeeded, right? And you know, the maniacness of the Intel uh, team. You know, this execution focus, this alignment. Uh, you know, we uh, you know sort of joked at different phases of Intel that it was the largest single cell organism on the planet, right? <laughs> you, right you, you know, in some aspects of that, make it powerfully good. But then, why are you spending billions of dollars on acquisitions? You know, why are you wasting your balance sheet? Obviously, you've decided as a, a company and as a board that we're going to pour billions of dollars into that acquisition. So, right, you know, huh, how do you justify the combination of saying we're going to expand into these adjacent areas, yet we're going to focus on our core that's produced such extraordinary results? Those are obviously incongruous, 
right, uh, demonstrations of leadership. And, and I think in it, right, you either need to learn what you can and can't do, or if you are gonna put billions into these acquisitions and put balance sheet dollars at play, then you better decide the rules of making them successful. Yeah. Uh, as, as well. And uh, so I think in that, in that respect, you're absolutely right. You know, why was Intel so successful? You know, that single cell organism, that extraordinary execution passion, right? You know, disciplined engineering, data-driven uh, uh, culture, right? This harshness, right, of the execution in some very tough business uh, areas. But then if you're gonna say, those are our core principles and we're never gonna deviate from those, then don't waste your money on you know, balance sheet on these acquisitions. Fair enough, yeah. Um, well, great, well, um, well, when we finished um, our last interview session with you, we just had you, you were just finishing describing your efforts in the first decade of the 2000s to really establish, well, some of what we were just talking about, Intel's dominance in sort of servers, uh, mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. of servers, um, after, your time as Intel's first CTO. And I w wanted to sort of take you back into that time and if you could talk about, you know, as your work on the server business was kind of reaching its natural endpoint, you know, what were you thinking and talking about doing next? Yeah, and the key, you know, as we were finishing that era, you know, we laid out the TikTok model, we laid out the multi-core strategy, you know, the integrated memory uh, controller, you know, we launched uh, what today, you know, became the Nehalem, uh, Westmere, you know, family of products. We had, to, you know, boy, this was starting to, right, turn around. And, uh, you know, one of my, uh, you know, as, as I look back on it, you know, Intel's market share, uh, price per socket, and margin of the server business became larger as a result of those products after that period of time than it was before the whole Opteron phase, which I sort of say, wow, you know, that's a turnaround that, you know, you just say, done, right? <laughs> it doesn't get better than that from a technical, you know, business architectural result. Um, and, you know, to a great degree, given the massiveness of the uh, of the data center business that came out of that for Intel, you just sort of say, does it get any better than that, right? Uh, and now I think it's you know close to 20 billion in revenue for the data center business with extraordinary margins, you know market share close to 100 percent, score baby. Now, but the other thing that we had turned our attention to, and I was turning my attention to, and I say this was the last on my list of things I wanted to get done. Uh, when I was the uh, head of the uh, enterprise business for Intel, was graphics and the uh, massive multi-core, right? And uh, we really saw that the space that NVIDIA with GP, GPUs, CUDA, you know, that whole space, and we sort of said, this matters. And, uh, you know, their, their silicon footprint Right, it was always sort of this view, right? Hmm, who has more transistors on here? Okay, memory, they're sort of commodity. You know, networking, you know, we gotta go attack networking. And you know, we started to build up the Intel networking business, but that graphics footprint, right? And people are starting to use that for non-graphics purposes with CUDA and GP, GPU. We didn't think of it through machine learning and AI as we would today, but those, you know, throughput workloads were getting bigger, mm -hmm. right? So when we started the, uh, you know, what became known as the Larrabee project was sort of the last big project that I was getting underway uh, at Intel. And I knew that if workloads emerged that weren't on the Intel architecture, Intel lost, mm. right? You know, and that was just the, you know, and so, you know, that project was underway. We, you know, had two purposes in it. One was high performance computing and one was graphics were sort of the two workloads that we were working on. Again, if we look at it today, we would have said over oh, five years ahead of our time, right? You know, in terms of getting a machine learning AI workload in place, it really wasn't seen quite yet as, you know, that, but it was a class of that whole, I'll say throughput oriented versus latency oriented workloads uh, that were really driving it. And that was sort of the last big thing I had underway. And when the EMC, offered me the job of going there as their president and CEO. Well, you know, I struggled because I had made a list of 10 things I wanted to get done, 
right? You know, when I took the job, uh, the enterprise job, took over the microprocessor development uh, engine for Intel, and the last one left was this graphics, right, throughput workload one, and I knew that wasn't done. Right, and so it's sort of like you know, I I never don't finish the job. Right, <laughs> yeah, so one of those I'm gonna, right, and I really struggled over leaving at the time because that one was undone, and uh, but nine out of ten were done. So right, and uh, you, you know, uh, was being wooed to consider uh, uh, coming over to EMC, and uh, in it, right, I knew that was really important. You know, it wasn't done, but it was a couple three more years to get it done. So, you know, I decided to leave at that point. That one was undone, and Intel killed it shortly after my departure, right? And, uh, you know, that was, that was hard, disappointing to see. And in retrospect, you know, NVIDIA would not be the company it is today had that been pursued, right? Because the workloads would have stayed on the Intel architecture. So right? you were on the, you felt given the benefit of 2020 20 hindsight, you were on the right track at that yep. point. You, right. you because, you know, again, you know, uh, if you look back then, NVIDIA wasn't talking about machine learning and AI. They were talking about, mach you know, these throughput workloads, you know, floating point performance, you know, floating point ops, right, and, and all of that. You know, and again, some of these workloads were starting to emerge. It was more aimed toward HPC kind of workloads, et cetera. You know, the graphics processor was getting generalized for the programming model. We were in the right space, right, right, and had, Intel stayed with it. The world of machine learning, AI, NVIDIA would be a fourth the size they are today, right? You know, as a company, because I think Intel really had a shot, right, in that space. And again, right, you know, those new things, and it sort of builds on the prior question as well. You know, these are hard problems, right, to predict the future. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on at that point. It requires extraordinary commitment, top down support you know, determination, you know, pounding through, you know, not one rev of the technology and boom, it gets right. You know, as I, I say, machine learning and AI, right, that whole space. We worked on it on the 8486 to add machine learning and, uh, you know, AI at the time, the age of thinking machines and, mm -hmm. you know, Lisp and Prolog and all of that kind of stuff. You know, we said, we're going to make the 46 a great AI chip. That was in 1986. Right, so I think of AI as a 30-year overnight success, right? Where a lot of these technologies, they curate over long periods of time. You know, algorithms are being uh, refined, and then all of a sudden the algorithms get good enough, the data gets big enough, and the overall compute capacity gets large enough that, oh, we can get interesting results. You know, and hey, you know, neural networks and, you know, the, you know, you know, convoluted neural nets and so those ideas were 20, 30 years old. But all of a sudden the algorithms have gotten good enough, the data big enough and the overall compute capacity where instead of having crappy vision, it's now better, right? You know, instead of having crappy chess, we're now better. <laughs> you know, we can now do go, right? All of a sudden we start seeing these breakthroughs occur, even though it took 30 years of building and refining those technologies. And that's exactly what happened to NVIDIA. And uh, I give great credit to the NVIDIA team, uh, to Bill Daly, Jensen, et cetera, because they were on, hey, there's a class of workloads here that are really important. And we're going to keep hammering and focusing, you know, building the, you know, software stack that allows that to occur, the whole CUDA architecture. And they never deviated from that. Hmm. We lost to Intel in the, in the latency workloads, right, operating systems, et cetera, Intel won. But there's another class of workloads here that are really important, and we're going to win those. And, you know, Intel gave up a shot to win those workloads at its, today, I say it's great demise, even though you say, boy, that was an extra 10 years of work. Yeah. It was 10 years of work to go make that happen. Do you think that it was in part um, that you weren't there to drive that forward that they decided to withdraw from that? Yeah, uh, I'll say very, very directly that, you know, boy, you need that harsh, right, uh, uh, determined, passionate leader. And when, you know, they, you know, they leave, you know, hey, you know, the next budget cycle, oh, we really can't afford that. Boy, it's a long time until it's profitable. And no, oh, no, we can't kill it. Yes, we can. No, I mean, you know, these are hard trade-offs in a big company. And, you know, budget cycles come and go. We all know the harsh cyclicality of the semiconductor uh, industry. You know, these aren't easy decisions, right, at the time. You know, what hurt me 
when it was killed soon after my departure. But you know, I also realize in a big company those kind of things happen, right? You, you realize that to be the case. And at the time, hey, the graphics program was struggling. Right? You know, it wasn't like you know it was an obvious, you know, hey, you know, it, you know, it wasn't a short chip shot onto the green. Right at that point, there was a lot of work to be done yet, and it was going to be multiple generations to really refine it. Yeah, building the software uh, architecture uh, to get it right really needed a, t a lot of top-down, uh, uh, you know, leadership to go get it done. So they decided to kill it after my departure. Disappointing. Uh, to me, and uh, something in retrospect, we're looking back now, almost 10 years later, you'd sort of say, boy, the world could have been different. Mm -hmm. Was it the case that people were, throughout your time at Intel, was it the case that people were uh, approaching you with, with other ideas and opportunities um, as the, the, the folks from EMC? Yeah, of course you have different opportunities, different jobs, you know, uh, uh, potential. You know, as, as I view it, you know, I've only really changed jobs once in my career, right? You know, I'm a fairly loyal soul, yeah. right, uh, at that level. And moving from EMC to VMware, that was sort of an in-the-family move. I don't even consider that changing jobs. So, you know, essentially I'm, I'm a very boring guy. I changed jobs once in, uh, you know, now 39 years, right, of uh, my career. And, and to some degree, that's sort of, you know, you get involved, you know, you build relationships, you get passionate, right? You know, you're always, you know, working on something today, but also always starting the next project and the next project, getting people rallied around it. You can't leave your team and your people. You know, and it really, uh, you know, I remember the, the uh, uh, day I'm sitting in one of my final ops reviews uh, at Intel. And uh, I have the, you know, nobody in the room knows this, but I have the Intel offer to stay in hand and the EMC offer to leave in hand, right? And my wife and I were about to go on sabbatical and I said I wasn't gonna decide until I got back from sabbatical, right? Uh, for, you know, I just needed time to clear my head. You know, and I started looking around the room and it's like, oh, there's Justin, you know, you know. His, uh, uh, you, know, I, you know, I was at his son's wedding, right? You know, he's coming to my daughter's, right, uh, graduation, right? You know, oh, there's Steve, right? Oh, my, yeah, he, he, he's coming to my uh, son's graduation as well. And, you know, all of a sudden tears start coming down my eyes because these, you know, after 30 years, you know, these aren't coworkers. You know, these are people that you've done life with. Right at that point, and you get so right. You know, you know where does work end and where does uh, you know your personal begin? After 30 years, you can't tell, right? Uh, you know at that point. So you know it was you know gruesomely hard decision. And uh, obviously, uh, EMC was like, hey, Pat, you know, we want you to, you know, uh, lead. You know, we're going to coach you and help develop you, right, to, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, our next uh, CEO. And uh, Joe was extraordinarily committed to that. And board members, you know, reached out and, you know, it became a, a good life decision uh, at the time. But uh, it was terribly hard, right, because this was, you know, this was 30 years of life. You know, as I, you know, as I joke, you know, I went through puberty at Intel, right? <laughs> you know, I started when I was, you know, so young and sort of like, boy, you know, and, uh, you know, I think if, uh, if Andy Grove uh, called me from the, from the grave and said, Pat, we need you back, I think I'd still answer the call, right? You know, it's just, you know, these are just so, such powerful uh, forces, right, in your life that, uh, boy, you just can't imagine, you know, not being part of their legacy. Well, this, I mean, it sounds so much like certainly a very big decision for you uh, personally and professionally, obviously, but also from just your brief description of it, it sounds like EMC was making, you know, a big strategic decision to um, get you to join them. And I wondered if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about you know, EMC as you had known it and why you think you, you know, became such a focus of their strategic thinking at that time. You know, why were they making such a big bet on you? Yeah, and there was uh, probably three or four things at play. Um, one is they did sort of lose the head of products, 
right? You know, Dave Donatelli, you know, he had just, you know, uh, you know, uh, left the company. So they were looking for somebody who was a product guy. Um, as a company, EMC uh, was uh, known for its products and its sales, but its product capacity had weakened over year over the years. So it still had, you know, one of the most revered sales forces on the planet, you know, but its product culture had diminished. So they were looking for somebody who was product through and through, a strong uh, uh, technologist uh, in that uh, respect. Um, I had gotten to know Joe, the CEO there, because I was selling EMC to move from the power architecture to the Intel architecture. You know, their storage array. So we had gotten to know each other through that. You know, so I'll say he had seen the, the uh, you know, the passion of Pat, right? <laughs> you know, you're going to move your storage onto our architecture, right? You know, resistance is futile, right? We're going <laughs> to, you know, bring you across the line. So we had gotten to know each other, re you know, reasonably well. Obviously, you know, he became reasonably uh, impressed with me at the time uh, to uh, want to pursue me. Um, you know, some of the board members, you know, were very aggressive. Uh, you know, the E and EMC was Jack, or was Dick Egan, right? His son, Jack, right, became, uh, you know, pretty aggressive at pursuing me and some of the other board members as well. So, uh, and my uh, capacity to interact with the board at Intel was rather limited. You know, here they were extremely aggressive and embracing me, mm. you know, particularly at that phase of my career where I said, you know, boy, I really do aspire to be CEO someday. And uh, they became very uh, committed that we're going to develop you. There's a bunch of things you don't know yet, right? If you're going to be a CEO, uh, they invested, uh, you know, one of them that was a lot of fun was uh, they uh, hired a personal corporate finance professor from Columbia to be my corporate finance tutor for a year. Right, you know, so you know they clearly were investing in, uh, you know, committing to you know help them build out that skill set because you know being a product uh, technology guy doesn't give you the the range of skills that you need, right, to be it. And then uh, and then I had a little family pull, right, because our family was East Coast based. And when I joined Intel, I says I'm going to be on the West Coast for two years. <laughs> you know, 30 years later, right, so they were super excited to see their black sheep coming home, right, uh, as well. And, you know, we had a wonderful three years in Boston. You know, we got down to my family in Pennsylvania. You know, one of my sons and his wife uh, came to, uh, you know, Boston for university. So they were in town and we, you know, would often, uh, you know, get our family up, my family up or go yeah. down to see him. So it was really a delightful three years. And then, of course, when I moved back to VMware in the West Coast, it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> he escaped again. Yeah. And my wife was actually, she was not happy about the move back to the Bay Area for VMware. Where, you know, as I describe, I sort of, you know, took her clawing and scratching across the nation, right back to the uh, Bay Area. She was really enjoying our time on the East Coast. Was it um, from the outside looking at it? Um, you know, EMC. Um, I think at that time, and certainly, you know, in 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 more recent years with VMware and everything, is so identified with kind of like. The data center and the cloud and 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 this sort of area, and it sounds like you know. So of course, you know, massive amounts of server chips involved. So it seems like there's a natural resonance there. If they were getting on kind of the Intel platform, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, with you comes a person who knows that exquisitely. You know, so that is taken care of. Um, but it also seems like you must have been, you know, really living in that, you know, emerging new kind of dominant area of computing, of the cloud, of data, the yeah, world yeah. of data centers while you were, you know, doing all this work at Intel. So was that part, did you see that as, you know, part of the connection of expertise and how you were going to revive their their the product side of what they were doing yeah, I think there was also you know part of it was uh, clearly leveraging and moving up the stack okay. as I would call it going from silicon to systems and when you've done your 12th microprocessor you know number 13 isn't quite as thrilling mm -hmm. right in that sense you're just not learning as much 
right, you know, at that level. And I didn't feel like Intel was really developing me to be that next leader. So some of it was leadership development, capacity, um, as uh, you know, the, the skills for CEO. Some of it was moving up the stack. Hmm, I know how to do chips, do I know how to do systems, right, uh, as well. And that was something that Intel did systems as a hobby. EMC did it as their lifeblood, right, and so learning that next level. Uh, also, you know, essentially uh, Intel, right, you know, didn't do any sales, right? You know, it did allocation. <laughs> right, and that's a little bit, you know, crass, but to a great degree, hey, you know, when you're in the silicon business, right, you know, if you build a hot product, you're just telling customers, this is how many you can have, and uh, we'll negotiate the price, right? And, uh, you know, essentially, you know, half of Intel's business was seven customers, right? You know, to get to half of EMC's business, I think you had to get to almost 2,000 customers. Right, so it was learning a lot more about sales and you know what that really uh, meant. So there was huge uh, uh, interest in that regard. Clearly, I'll say, you know, silicon wasn't, you know, and I was, de you know, very much sensing that, you know, silicon, as thrilling as it was for my first couple of decades at Intel, it was really the center, the nexus of innovation, was happening at silicon, where you could tell it was moving up in a way that systems and software are becoming much more the nexus of innovation and where, you know, those key inflection points were happening uh, uh, in the industry. And, you know, clearly cloud was starting to emerge, but wasn't very clear yet what that really was, you know, quite yet. But this idea of, you know, systems and software becoming more critical, distributed systems becoming more critical. You know, I sense that, you know, where the core of innovation was, was moving north and doing the 13th microprocessor of my career, you know, wasn't going to be the thing that necessarily was, you know, those marks on the wall that I think were having the industry impact, you know, that the first dozen had, or creating USB, or Wi-Fi, or PCI, or, you know, some of the other key standards uh, impacts that we were uh, creating. So, you know, I was excited to move on to a faster learning curve, right, as you moved up into the stack. You know, clearly the, you know, leadership and skill development uh, as well, and still uh, being the ambassador of Intel and the x86 into this whole other system segment as well. So did you have, uh, you know, I presume in joining EMC, you must have had, <clears throat> you know, a very positive view as to what their future might be. Uh, did you have a clear idea of how to get there? I mean, did you have a plan or a, a, a vision in mind uh, as you joined, or was that something that evolved once you got there? Um, you know, somewhat, you know, and I was incredibly naive in what it meant. Hey, you know, a hotshot uh, silicon guy, I can go make uh, storage systems a whole lot better. Right? You know, you have this <laughs> you know, sort of naive view, and I remember one of the first meetings I was in, we were having a roadmap discussion, and mostly it was, you know, them teaching me. But I remember in this one conversation, we got into it, and I said, no, that's not right. That's not how it works. And literally, before the meeting ended, we were down to the schematic diagrams of the uh, storage processors using the x86. And I was explaining you know, how they should be using the processor in this uh, you know, uh, cross-connected, redundant uh, fashion. And was, you know, and every, you know, everybody left the meeting, and they're like, oh, we really have a product guy now <laughs> uh, for it. But there was a lot of naiveness, in my view. But, you know, that's also where you grow and learn. As I say, you know, you grow and learn in times of change or challenge, right? You know, when you're being a successful, right, you know, you don't learn much, right? You know, you might be pomp and arrogant and, you know, be, I'm good, right? Well, you're not really good, right? You know, you're mostly lucky in doing things that others have gone in success. You know, as they say, you know, success has many uh, fathers and, uh, you know, failures an orphan. Right, you know, in you know, failure and in challenge or in times of dramatic change, right? And going to an East Coast uh, enterprise software led right, systems company, that was radical. Right? So it was a huge time of growth for me. And you know, and I was just really, you know, eating it up. Right, uh, at that learn, you know, having to learn system, you know, what, what, what's a block storage versus a file storage versus, uh, you know, what is that talking about? What is this fiber channel thing anyway? And, you know, and, you know, you're learning all these new things, but you're bringing a wealth of experiences also into that environment, many of which are highly leverageable uh, as well. So it was a thrilling time uh, for me personally. 
right, to learn. And the combination, I'll say, of my uh, Intel experiences, of which many of those interfaced with VMware, and my EMC experiences, where I had a lot of ambassador roles to VMware, right, you know, on behalf of uh, EMC, you know, really prepared me to come back and I think have a, you know, pretty exceptional run, right, as the CEO of uh, VMware. And, you know, as I, I sort of like to say, God doesn't waste experiences. <laughs> you just don't know yet how they're going to be useful, right, in many cases. So you mentioned one thing, that is the East Coast culture, whatever, is, was that, did, was there a significant difference in terms of East Coast versus West Coast, or certainly maybe Intel versus uh, EMC? Yeah, you know, there was uh, uh, just a few little uh, examples of that. You know, I remember one time I was meeting with one of the board members, Jack Egan, and I asked him, uh, Jack, and this is the son of the founder, right? You know, Jack, you know, how am I doing? What do I need to work on? And he says, we're an East Coast company. You need to dress like an East Coast company. <laughs> I dress like an engineer because that's what I was, right? You know, it's like, okay, honey, we're going to Nordstrom's tonight, right? <laughs> right. You know, it's like people showed up for meetings with ties, right? And there weren't customers there. What's the matter with you, right? You know, it's like, you know, some of that formality. You know, another example was I remember one of the first ops reviews I was sitting in and so on like that. You know, and you know, Intel is just extraordinarily direct. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, and so on like that. So this one little topic comes up and, you know, sort of discussing it a little bit. And I say, so what other data do we need on this topic to make a decision? Uh, and everybody sort of says, no, I think we have all the data. I says, why don't we decide? Well, we wanted to take it offline and discuss it a little bit. And I said, why? Right now, let's get it done, right? You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, sort of say, well, we want to discuss, you know, some of the, you know, other organizational implications. I said, well, let's figure it out right now. Let's decide. We got all the data you just said we did. Let's do it. Everybody's like, Godzilla has arrived, right? <laughs> right? You know, and this directness, this bluntness, this harshness about data. You know, right? Oh, we step on a few toes. Who cares, right? You know, we're going to go fast and get things done. And you know, boy, you know, it was very much, uh, much more. You know, well, we got consider the people issues and teams and organizations and you know and Intel in many respects you know and I'll say you know super successful culture but it was also harsh mm -hmm. right and had a very hard edge and many times people were crushed in the process of that without good reason mm -hmm. right you know and you remember the you know the famous Intel phrase uh, constructive confrontation right and just we forgot sometimes the constructive piece Right, you know, it was just you know hard, you know hard nosed confrontation, and a lot of those soft skills, to me, were very much lost at Intel, where you know, and I, and this is what I grew up in, you know. So hey, I was ready to mix it up with the best of them. You know, I remember, you know, uh, you know some of the interactions with the teams in Israel who are known for you know their bluntness and directness. They sort of says, Pat, you're more Israeli than the Israelis are, and so they, <laughs> right? You know, because you know, that's what I grew up in. You know, remember I went through puberty here, right? And then you know bringing that into a culture that was much more worried about some of the people implications, and again, you know, just different. You know, it's not one is better than the other, they're very different. And out of that, you know, I think I became, you know, much, uh, much more thoughtful on people skills and teams and relationships and how you, you know, build that. And as you come now to a software company where, hmm, you know, some of those harsh skills, yeah, we need some of the discipline and rigors associated with it, but some of the, you know, you, know, you can't piss off, uh, you know, one of your key software engineers and expect them to stay. Right, you know, in a fab environment, you can, right? <laughs> yeah, right, you know, what are you going to do, right? You know, you're going to, you know, go get this done. And the culture was so, so very different in that sense. So the cultural aspects of that, while radically different, right, in East Coast culture, more of a sales culture, more of a people centric versus a product centric uh, culture. But I learned a lot in that process as well. I'll say it really rounded my leadership uh, skills quite significantly. How was, uh, when, you, when you made the jump to EMC um, in 2009, it had, if, if my research serves me well, in 2004 it had acquired VMware, and in 2006 it had acquired RSA Security um, in addition to a variety of others. Uh -huh. So those are some, some big names that it was bringing in in, in and big and important um, operations that it was kind of bringing in. 
How was it, how were things um, organized and orchestrated? Were, was, were VMware and RSA relatively sort of like autonomous divisions or was it very integrated? Could you describe yeah. that yeah. scene? And you know, EMC, I think, um, was correctly saying, hey, we gotta go acquire other things because the storage industry by itself isn't gonna be the future. You know, and you know, they really took this, I'll say, this era of the internet build out, you know, the four horsemen of the internet and EMC's role in that, you know, the huge profitability of its uh, storage rates and saying, boy, we got to go acquire and build out some other uh, uh, assets. And that was very much uh, Joe Tucci and uh, RSA, Documentum, right, uh, you know, some of the backup products, Avamar, you know, it was a pretty, you know, you know, very quickly, you know, going and building out a set of different, uh, you know, portfolio of assets that largely were enterprise centric, right. right, could leverage this big enterprise sales capacity, but they were off to have a broader data center infrastructure set of assets to play. Now, when it acquired VMware, right, Joe Tucci, and I think this will probably go down as one of his greatest moves of all time. You know, he bought uh, VMware for, I think, $625 million. Uh, I think as of today, we're just at about a $75 billion market cap, right? You know, it's like, wow, right? You know, you just, you know, this is beyond exceptional. Right? And again, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of work to go accomplish that. It's not like, you know, boom, you know, it just magically happened. But wow, right at that level. In 2007, they had spun VMware out, right? They had done the public offering for it. So VMware was largely separate. Okay. Right, it was run separately, et cetera. And again, I had the, you know, the role of the ambassador to manage the EMC VMware relationship. Right, you know, so I was responsible for essentially the portfolio role that VMware had, but it was largely run separately by the VMware leadership team. I get it, and this was EMC had like an 80% stake. Exactly, exactly. Okay. They had a majority stake, but they ran it separately in the separate board structure that was there. Everything else worked for me. RSA worked for me, all of the storage products worked for me, you know, Documentum and, you know, the other uh, assets that they, uh, every other product asset worked for me, okay. right, except VMware, right? And, uh, you know, the core business, though, was storage. You know, everything else was sort of on the periphery, so job one was get the storage business back to health. Right, and uh, we had companies like NetApp that you know were sort of chewing into the storage business with some different ideas, and you know as I would say, uh, uh, you know NetApp was gaining market share, EMC was flattening, and uh, over the course of uh, my time as the uh, leader there, we reversed those. Right, you know, so I felt really good that we got e, uh, EMC back on a growth trajectory. We had done a few acquisitions, built out the portfolio, uh, data domain, Isilon, but also just got core innovation back into it. So, uh, you know, by the time I exited uh, EMC, we had gained on the order of uh, 12, 15 points of storage market share. Right, and uh, had sort of blunted NetApp's growth. And, uh, you know, so that was sort of good. You know, that was job one for me from the board, right, was turn this around. You know, we can't let them continue to grow up, so job done, which did make for a very, very curious moment. Um, the first day on the job at VMware, right, uh, was VMworld, right, the big VMware uh, conference. I took over. Right, Paul Moritz, the CEO before me, uh, announced me as the new CEO. I took the stage, right, gave the keynote for it, and that night was the NetApp uh, customer and partner event. And I'm on stage with Tom Jorgens, the CEO of NetApp, because NetApp was a huge partner of VMware. So here's a big NetApp, right? You know, Pat with uh, NetApp, Tom, right? You know, and we were on the pitcher's mound at PG&E Park where VMworld was at the big customer and partner event. And that picture gets tweeted out to the, right, uh, bloodthirsty, raw meat eating EMC sales force. And I am now getting thousands of emails, <laughs> traitor, turncoat, right? So <laughs> coming my way. Since yesterday I was enemy number one for NetApp, 
And today I'm partner number one for uh, NetApp, so it was uh, you know a rather humorous moment there, seeing how uh, you know how your friends quickly. Uh, <laughs> Well, what would you say was um, your primary strategy in that turnaround of the storage business for yeah, EMC? And, yeah, part of it was um, uh, we didn't have a good file strategy, so we acquired Isilon. Part of it was the product engine was sort of sputtering, so we had to bring innovation back into the core you know, uh, product uh, machine of EMC. Too many products, uh, somewhat scattered. They had acquired you know, uh, different product lines, but hadn't really synthesized them together. And then uh, the other was data domain, well, you know, the hot backup and archive uh, uh, solution and really exercising that very effectively. And by the way, we were commenting on my acquisition learnings. And to me, that was sort of the first major acquisition uh, at uh, EMC that was under my leadership. Okay. So now I had all the bad learnings right? Uh, some of EMC's better experiences on how they did it, right? So Joe and the leadership team is saying, no, no, do this, do that. You know, so that combination of what not to do, some of their successes and data domain became a roaring success uh, for uh, EMC, extraordinarily successful. So how to make the sales model, the innovation model uh, work there, uh, integr uh, you know, integrating that in an effective way. So you know, I really saw as sort of my first uh, test case for many of those learnings coming together into a very successful uh, acquisition experience. Was Veritas one of your competitors in that yes. area? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did a oral history with Mark Leslie, so okay. I okay. understand a little bit of. of of, yeah. of that yeah, so scene. Veritas was a, you know, Symantec, the net backup yeah. and uh, uh, networker um, and, uh, you know, some of the other uh, companies, uh, uh, their uh, NetApp was using, you know, its products as a store, as a backup uh, device as well. Uh, data domain, NetApp attempted to acquire them and EMC took it off the table, right? So that sort of built a little bit more of that grudge match as well between the two companies. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a nice competitive dynamic there, and, and like I say, uh, you know, in my leadership time there, we're very successful to get EMC back on the right uh, track. And that's pretty quick, right? Three years or so you were at it. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly felt good that you know the uh, uh, you know we increased the uh, market uh, share by about ten to fifteen uh, points over that time period. Increased profitability. Uh, we increased uh, EMC's market cap by like 60% uh, over that three years. So I think all of a sudden the markets are saying, oh, right, they're getting their mojo back as well. And uh, again, with a very, very capable sales force, you know, you start putting better products in their hands, okay, good stuff happens. Right. Right? And as I said, a great learning experience for me as well. Well, tell us if you would uh, about then the shift to VMware. What was your thinking? Um, you know, what, what was EMC's thinking as the major shareholder for VMware? Yeah. How'd that, how did that take place? Yeah, it was really uh, Paul Moritz had replaced Diane Green as the CEO at VMware. And, uh, you know, Diane was, uh, you know, moved on. And, you know, there's clear tension because, you know, she was, you know, uh, here, here I'd call it seller's remorse. Right, you know, instead of buyer's remorse, you know, right? Soon after she sold the company to EMC, it's like, boy, you know, I really want all my independence, but EMC now is the majority shareholder, and it, you know, so there's clear tension there. EMC did the public offering exactly like Joe committed, but there was clear tension, right? You know, hmm, this is how we, you know, want you to operate in this model, and you know, uh, very quickly it sort of was a parting of the ways after the public offering, and then Paul Moritz was on the EMC team, and uh, Joe moved him to be the CEO, okay. right? Uh, and uh, that was from 2008 to 2012. Okay. And I'm leading the product uh, efforts. Uh, Paul, you know, managed that, and you know, a founder transition is hard, right? If it goes well, it's hard, right? Because Diane was the founder of VMware, you know, everybody there worked for her. Her husband, uh, Mendel, was the CTO, so he was the sort of the brains and so on. And they were sort of, uh, you know, a package, right? When Diane left, Mendel left, so you had the technical leadership as well as the, you know, CEO and inspirational leadership. So Paul had an enormous task to sort of, you know, stabilize the ship 
uh, in that regard. But you know, Paul is a visionary leader, mm. right? And VMware needed somebody who was more of an operational uh, leader at that phase of its uh, uh, growth. And uh, so it became obvious that hmm, somebody more of Pat Silk, right, fit, but needed to still be very technical. Uh, Paul, uh, Joe, and I agreed also to form Pivotal at the time. Right, we had some data assets, some developer assets that weren't being, uh, you know, I'll say, well leveraged uh, inside of the companies. So we said we're going to form Pivotal and remove we'll Paul to be the CEO of that. We'll bring Pat over to be the CEO of VMware. So as I say, it was sort of in the family uh, move, and we'll make some product transitions on the EMC side. And voila, you know, I'm the CEO of uh, VMware moving over there, and you know, again, you know, bringing some of that organizational discipline, execution discipline, uh, you know, product and technology awareness, you know, what are we going to focus on? And uh, VMware's core product, the hypervisor, the virtual machine, was flattening in the industry. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm super proud of now, you know, the VMware was less than $4 billion in revenue when I came in, and sort of growth rate was plat flattening. You know, now we're just under $9 billion of revenue, and growth rate is accelerating. And uh, for that, it's sort of like, okay, you know, we got this machine humming. You know, we sort of, you know, grew well past our act one, the virtual machine. We now have a rich portfolio of products, seeing our uh, growth rate accelerate. You know, it's been a great uh, six years as CEO. Um, well, could you, I guess by this time, by when you're thinking of, of, of making that move, 2012, you know, the, the cloud, if you will, is starting to become more visible. Yes. More, yes. you know, um, public clouds, private clouds, um, and this almost idea of, um, you know, data centers almost becoming a, a commodity environment. Yes, yes. Or quite literally a kind of a commodity environment. And, um, the, the turn from people's use of computers rather than being, you know, a physical server or a physical unit, you know, now people are spinning up machines as they need them and things like that. And that's really starting to emerge at this time. I would just be interested to hear you talk about, you know, how that looked to you then and how it's looking to you now, you know, how yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think, uh, you know, this whole notion of cloud is uh, such a profound notion because it essentially turns, you know, the virtual machine turned a server into a provider of workloads, mm. right? You know, where you didn't have to go, you know, configure hardware, right? Boom, you just spin up a virtual machine. Um, and uh, you didn't have to acquire it, you didn't have to provision it, you know, boom, it just sort of magically happened. Well, cloud does that at scale, right, for the entirety of an application, right? And you run it for me, right? You know, and oh, wow, that's powerful. And to a great degree, you know, some people in a lot of the early positioning of cloud was that it was cheaper. You know, that was bogus, right? It was easier, right? You know, I didn't have to go to that stupid, slow IT guy who's making me do some trouble ticket right request for it. You know, he may or may not get around to it for 90 days, right? You know, so I can spin up my next application. I go to the cloud, I put in my Amex card, I have it after lunch. Right? right? You know, it was just easy, it was fast, right? And over time it got better as well. And in many cases, you know, it, it was cost effective. Right? So that easy button, you know, became the moniker of the cloud. And to some degree, I, I would say the cloud did to data centers what VMware did to servers, hmm. right? And, you know, they did to that scale, a capacity with a business model that just changed the game uh, entirely. And uh, every cloud uses virtual machines, right. right? You know, so we're sort of an underlying agreement, but v, uh, ingredient, but VMware didn't put the whole solution together. Right, the APIs, the portals to make that easy at scale in a public cloud way, because we were having so much success still fixing the compute servers in the data center. So to a great degree, I think VMware had the opportunity to be the Amazon, 
mm -hmm. right, of the public cloud IaaS models. It had sort of the right stuff and some of the right ideas, but we didn't go operationalize that business model, you know, like Andy Jassy and uh, uh, Amazon uh, did. When I got to VMware, it's like, boy, this cloud stuff is starting to take off. This is 2012, we gotta go. And we had a project internally that we turned into the VMware cloud and became uh, vCloud Air, right? Boom, we're gonna go get that underway. So within about a year of me getting to it, we launched the vCloud Air product, where we're gonna compete with Amazon and Azure and uh, so on. And uh, we weren't running out to go, uh, you know, run our own cloud. And, you know, we're struggling to get that underway. We got a lot of other stuff going on. We don't have all the ingredients yet trying to build it. And as that's going on, as we're sort of, you know, you know, say starting to ramp our own cloud, Amazon is just taking off, mm. right? You know, their, you know, their growth rate is accelerating in this period of time, right? They're already, you know, six, seven years ahead of us, right? And they're accelerating, you know, and that gap became larger and larger. And as we're sort of sputtering to get vCloud Air underway, everybody's saying, hmm, right, are you going to be able to compete? Right? It takes a lot of capital to compete. We're a software company and you know, plunking down data centers and you know, building out global networks and all of those kind of things. You know, Microsoft, they had the opportunity to uh, leverage their investments in Office 365 and some of the other uh, web properties. Right? And they were already you know, uh, 60, 70 billion dollar companies. So boom, they could sort of hide an extra few billion of capital into it. You know, I'm a $4 billion software company. I don't get to hide a couple of billion of capital to go right. build that out into uh, our P&L. So all of a sudden people were questioning this, uh, you know, can you guys compete? Right? You know, are you going to pour the billions into it that's required to compete as Amazon has taken off and Azure has taken off and Google, well, hey, search, you know, they already have a global network, they have big data centers, so they can go and take, you know, how are you going to compete? And that led to what became, you know, the critical uh, partnership where we exited the vCloud Air business and partnered with Amazon. And that was sort of the seminal shift in uh, VMware strategy where we became you know, a fundamental partner with them, as I would say, bringing the leader in private cloud together with the leader in public cloud to deliver the hybrid cloud. And that's been an extraordinarily successful partnership you know, that we forged over the last uh, two and a half, three years since we announced that relationship. And now we're seeing great momentum for that. We've also partnered with IBM, Alibaba, uh, have a wide set of people who use our software to run clouds now. It's really a software and SaaS business model without owning the underlying hardware and capital uh, for it. But, uh, you know, this, this era of cloud, if we think about it, you know, if we just, you know, step back for a second. Imagine you and I had a great idea for a new application uh, 20 years ago, right? Oh, but it's, boy, it's going to take a lot of data centers. We're going to have to plop them around the world, right? You know, and build, build out a lot of capacity because this is going to be a great new app, big data requirements and so on. You know, that might have taken us two years to build that infrastructure. You know, maybe a billion dollars of capital, right? We have to, oh, we have to put one in Singapore. We probably need to have one in Japan. We need one in Europe. We need one West Coast, East Coast, et cetera, right? Wow, a billion dollars to go get that, it underway. And then we have to get the connectivity in place, et cetera, you know, two, three years. Today, I can do that this weekend with my Amex card using the cloud. Right, where I can have global resources made available at scale that I can begin to provision and run that. You know, years have become days, right? Billions have become millions, right? To go get, you know, uh, you know and that's the magic of cloud. I mean, it just has so compressed and reduced both the cost and the time and the scale that you have available. We're literally now, you know, your Amex card, well, at least you know, Somebody's right. Amex card. Some ex, you know, Michael yeah. Dell. Michael a Dell's better Amex one card. Than mine. Right. You know, Michael Dell's Amex card. Right. I can build the world's largest supercomputer. Right. Right. Assemble it. Right. Over a, a day or two, and then decompose it over a day. Right. You know, it's just a, so magical the computing scale that now is available to any application developer on the planet. And I call us that we're entering what I call the era of the superpowers, right? And I call the four, you know, in the superpowers, we used to refer to them as nation states. You know, now they're technologies, 
right? And as I describe it, the four superpowers of today are cloud, mobility, AI, and IoT. Cloud, like we just described, unlimited scale. Literally, I can have any capacity of computing you want. How many million servers do you want, right? Extraordinary scale. Mobility, you know, we're now over half of the planet is connected, right? You know, I can reach billions of customers over that mobile network and, you know, onto mobile devices anywhere on the planet, unlimited reach. Uh, uh, AI, I can bring intelligence to everything, right? It's just, you know, I have the scale, I have the data, I have the algorithms, I can bring intelligence to everything. And IoT, you get to bridge the digital and physical world as never before. Wow. And each one is making each other better. I mean, it's this extraordinary era that we're in. You know, and I'll say that's sort of part of being the fun of, uh, you know, the CEO of VMware now. We're sort of sitting in the nexus of many of those. And if you go back to earlier in the conversation, as I said, it felt like, you know, the nexus of innovation was leaving the silicon layer, mm -hmm. right, and moving up. And now, right, you know, to me, those four in conjunction you know, that's where the nexus of innovation is occurring today, right? Where cloud, mobility, AI, and IoT, you know, are really not just powerhouses by themselves, but they're causing each other to get faster. Because if I have big cloud, I can have more mobility connected. More mobility, I connect more, more data, which makes my AI better. I can then, you know, execute it over my IoT with more introspection and, you know, inflection points, which, gives me more use for my cloud, right? These become these reinforcing. And, you know, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, as I like to uh, describe it today, the fastest day of tech innovation of your life. Today is the slowest day of tech innovation of the rest of your life, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> every day it expands. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, you were just saying a few minutes ago that, um, Initially, maybe when people were making the argument about cloud, that it would be cheaper, that that was not the case, that it was faster, but it was still plenty Fast expensive. Fast and easy. But, but, but now, that has changed. Yeah. Now it is just cheaper. And in, in many cases, a well-run private cloud, your data center, and I, I call it the three laws. Why will people run, given you now have this unlimited scale of public cloud, why would you ever run a data center yourself, okay. right? And I will assert the three laws, right? Laws of physics, right? Laws of economics, and laws of the land, mm. right? And laws of physics. Hey, if I need low latency, I can't be round tripping to the cloud and back, right? You know, so if you know I need to respond in 50 millisecond, if that's a shadow or a grandma on my uh, driving, hey, on my st March Street, you know, I can't. Right, give a 100 millisecond round trip to the cloud. I needed this, right? So latency, uh, laws of economics, right? You know, if I'm doing a surveillance application, you know, how many uh, pictures of the cat do I need to send to the cloud, right? You know, you, you need intelligence locally, right? You know, so, you know, maybe learning I do in the cloud, but inference I got to do locally, mm. right? You know, I can't be, you know, and bandwidth still costs, right? You know, storage still costs, so laws of economics but laws of the land, right? You know, where certain applications, certain data sets, people will dictate them uh, into uh, certain provenances, right, of execution. And those reasons, as I would say, and with the emergence of edge and IoT, I think we'll see a, a swing. And, you know, one of the other things that, you know, I've observed is over the history of computing, you know, we've been oscillating between centralized and decentralized and distributed over the history of computing. Cloud has been a force of centralization, yeah. right? You know, I'll run your data centers for you, right? Well, I believe Edge and IoT will be a force of decentralization, right? Where it will push more computing and capacity back to the edge. And then, uh, you know, maybe 5G and low latency will help push it back, right? And we're gonna see that pendulum move back and forth. You know, and again, it used to all just be a mainframe. Hmm, and then we could distribute mini computers, and then mini computers became centralized, and we needed distributed PCs, and P, you know, and one after the other has, you know, have different effects of centralization and decentralization, and you know, clearly it's not one versus the other, and that's why we would argue that the future is the hybrid cloud, 
right? And you know, this ability to operate between private resources and public resources and bind them together in flexible and uh, interchangeable fashions. Where this workload, oh, it's running pretty good, but I need lower latency for it. I can move it to the edge. Oh, you know, the networks are getting fast enough, I can move it back to the cloud. Oh, the law changed in Malaysia. I have to move it on premise. Oh, you know, they're now allowing me, right, to uh, centralize that in UK, but Germany still requires it local, right? You know, it's not one versus the other, right? And it's not going to be a static picture as technologies emerge, you know, different laws, regulations uh, occur. Let me ask you a question about, just for clarification on the laws of physics, the uh, latency time and so forth. You said the private cloud has the advantage. Is that because of the control of the workload or it's certainly not location? Well, part of it's location uh, as well, right? You know, I can push the, uh, you know, put the compute and the storage capacity locally, you know, or closer to where, you know, where the inference or the use of that is actually uh, occurring. You know, if the robotic arm needs 20 millisecond response time, hey, you know, that, that mini data center is going to sit right in the factory. Okay, so right. you're talking about smaller kind of scale things that you would need locally versus? Could be, but even there, you know, uh, imagine a, uh, you know, an aircraft carrier. You know, there's a mini data center, right, on the front of the boat and the back of the boat and it only has satellite uh, connectivity, so it got a frickin' thin pipe. You know, I mean, these are pretty meaningful compute capacity. Imagine an oil rig. Right, you know, there's, and in an IoT world, that oil rig is going to become much more instrumented with dramatically more data and compute occurring there. And it got a teeny tiny pipe, mm -hmm. right, back, uh, t you know, comparatively to the amount of uh, telemetry, analytics, et cetera, uh, that's occurring. So, you know, it really isn't just one or the other in that sense, right? And uh, latency, you know, bandwidth, uh, laws, right, regulatory uh, requirements. Uh, you know, one of my, you know, uh, one of our customers, uh, you know, one of the big bank CIOs, he says, you know, every application that doesn't touch money or uh, customers, I can move to the cloud. And if I find one of those, I'll shoot the person working on it, <laughs> right? Because he says, everything I do touches money or customers, right? If I'm doing anything else, tell me what it is. I, <laughs> I want to get rid of that guy, right? <laughs> right, in that sense. So, you know, and they're viewing the regulatory requirements are so high right, on one of the yeah. cannot fail financial institutions that, boy, can I trust the cloud guy to do it? And again, you know, so some industries will be very slow, right, to move to public cloud enablement. Maybe they do some test and dev there, you know, but their, you know, uh, operations requirements, resilience uh, requirements, regulatory. Uh, that same CIO once he told me, he said, hey, Pat, today's a great day. I only have two regulators here today. <laughs> right, you know, so many different regulations. It's similar in healthcare, right, government applications, right? You know, and even, you know, the uh, mighty Amazon public cloud, they've built the local instance of the public cloud for government. That's what the FedRAMP, right, uh, GovCloud is for Amazon, right? You know, it's essentially their own private cloud on the other side of essentially the government's firewall. Right, that's locally operated inside of the government by government certified personnel, only government workloads, meeting all the regulatory requirements. So, you know, in that sense, you know, it's not one versus the other, and that's why we say the answer is a hybrid future, right? Because that really gives you the ability, you know, and maybe this app, you know, is running, it's tied to some physical IP addresses, it uses this physical store, right, you know, that I have, it still is tethered to some mainframe, you know, it's going to be there forever. Hmm, the latency of moving that to the cloud, you know, the bandwidth requirements, right, ah, oh, boy, you know, it's going to be forever. So we really see it as, you know, a hybrid world is not a way station to the future, it is the future. How do you see this, or what is the split in your revenue for private versus public cloud? Yeah, so give, t give three, three different perspectives on that. Our revenue is over 90% private cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our heritage, right? You know, and we're building up the public cloud revenues uh, as we go as a company. You know, we're now at 10% uh, of our revenues at that level. And I say we are disproportionately private cloud, mm -hmm. right, to private data center, because that's where our heritage has been. And we're a little bit late, as I already said, in building up some of our public uh, cloud offerings. The industry metric is now about 75-25.
right? We're about 25% of revenues and workloads are now public cloud-based, right, today versus 75 uh, on-premise. And if you measure that by workloads, to me, that's a pretty good moniker, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, when you're in the cloud, they're operating it. When you're private, it's not just the hardware and the software, but also the personnel costs, right, of running it for you. So workloads, I think, is a pretty good way to measure those. And today, it's like 75, 25, you know, 70, 30. You know, I expect it gets to be 50-50. Right? And some would project that it gets 70% you know, public cloud, but then I believe that edge becomes this force going in the other direction. So my best view of the future is it gets to be 50-50. But today there's something on the order of 170, 180 million workloads as measured by OS instances, mm -hmm. right? You know, private and public today. And we expect that becomes well over a billion over the next decade because computing continues to expand, the applications continue to expand, and then key new technologies like containers and Kubernetes will help to expand and microservices will increase the number of workloads as we go forward. Is it, do you see a similarity between, and, and thinking of a little bit of the microprocessor story in that, in thinking about hybrid clouds where, you know, a, um, you could almost think of it about uh, networked uh, microprocessors, you know, so sometimes where um, the, uh, if you have a, a private cloud, it's, it's the same structure as uh, the, the public cloud, but it's just a matter of scale, you know, it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's server racks with mm -hmm. lots of microprocessors. So that in a way, um, you know, these, organization of computing into these clouds, whether they're at different sizes, um, in different, um, you know, run as uh, privately, private clouds or large public clouds. It's almost like the, the cloud has become the unit of compute where the microprocessor have been before. Is there anything to that? Yeah, I, I, mean, believe, there's I, a I believe there's a lot to that. Right? Okay. You know, I say, you know, the cloud is now the data center, right? You know, we're boom, you have these at scale, you have such massive resources available, you know, they're readily available, easy to use. I've always viewed that computing follows the gas law, right? It fills the available space. <laughs> Right, you know, it always keeps expanding, and it's really more a statement, you know, um, uh, you know, where uh, computing. How much computing do you want to do? Well, as much as I can afford, right? You know, how many more simulations do you do, right? You know, before you send a chip to the fab. Well, as many as I can get done before, you know, I think I've you know exhausted. But there's always more tests you can run. You know, how many more analysis of your radiology? right, uh, uh, results do you want, right, running through the AI algorithms to determine if it's carcinomic or not? Well, as many as you can afford, right? <laughs> you know, please give me the best results you can, right? Or, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. So to me, you know, computing has always wanted to fill the available space, where the available space is often more limited by economics than anything else, right? And if I make the unit cost of computing lower, Right, and the ability to reach the data, right? You know, so data storage, you know, the network, you know, I got to be able to connect to it, and you know, it's the whole set of computing uh, resources. Every time there's a dramatic decrease in that, right, you open up new opportunities for computing, yeah. right? If we use the AI example, you know, the you know hidden Markov models, you know, convoluted neural nets, et cetera, those ideas were around. All of a sudden, that got economical, right? And cloud made it economical. And all of a sudden, cloud-made data sets large enough that I could use learning algorithms that before were infeasible, now became feasible, right, uh, as well. So that combination, combination of compute capacity and data sets, right, you know, allowed AI to start demonstrating meaningful breakthroughs. And now it's sort of like, wow, how much computing do you need for AI? Well, the learning algorithms, it's almost unlimited. Right, you know, really, you know, if you give me, you know, another a thousand GPUs in my GPU farm, I'll use them all, 
right? <laughs> you know, you know how you know when you know things you know we have many of you know the hardest problems uh, in computing. I've always demonstrated this characteristic. Uh, you know whether it's you know weather prediction, whether it's you know predictive modeling, whether it's uh, computational fluid dynamics. You know these are you know uh, uh, n uh, you know uh, uh, you know n complexity uh, algorithms that boy you can just keep throwing computing uh, at them. You come up with a different algorithmic breakthrough. Right, it just keeps expanding, and I think that's one of the things that cloud has done. Right, it's making you know not just the accessibility, but also the cost characteristics very predictable. Right, mm -hmm. you know, for it, and you can look forward. I can tell you today, you know, what you know, a thousand cores will cost you. Right, you know, with a terabyte of memory next year. With high accuracy, you can access it. You, know, you can predict uh, where it's available. You can start experimenting with those. And then, uh, you know, why are people putting GPU farms now into their cloud? Oh, it has a lower economic cost for certain workloads to run them through GP GPUs. Oh, Jensen's a happy guy, right? Because <laughs> now, you know, boy, I need more of those. And then people are saying, well, some of the core AI algorithms, maybe I commit them to FPGAs. Right, you know, because I'll get another order of magnitude improvement in the cost of economics. And if that happens, what's going to happen? I'm going to do more. More and more. Right, because now I can, you know, start taking more aggressive use of some of those learning algorithms. Maybe it's going to be inference algorithms. Boy, I, you know, I can't afford to put inference at the edge yet. Hmm. You know, so I might have to compress those and do some algorithmic breakthroughs. You know, maybe I have to start putting more fixed function uh, into some of my compute capacity so I can get it to the edge because I really, if I can do inference at the edge, wow, I can start open up uh, new machine learning, new vision algorithms, new detection algorithms at the edge, but I need to get them maybe two orders of magnitude cheaper right. or lower power and boom, I can go make it happen. And every time you do that, oh, all sorts of new applications emerge. Right when when you do it, and that's really the beauty of technology, sort of over and over again, right? Because remember, we started out just doing, you know, all of computing started out by, uh, uh, you know, uh, computing, uh, you know, missile, uh, you know, bomb paths, and <laughs> you know, uh, being able to compute census. It was just, you know, I just need to add, right? Yeah. You know, so we've just been doing calculators at scale, right? You know, for the, our entire existence. Well, it's it's. It's interesting because the, you know this the notion of a hybrid cloud goes inside of kind of the data center with you know it's not just it's not a monoculture inside there you have mm -hmm. the GPUs and the FPGAs and yeah. the standard yeah. kind of server backbone um, that I think is fascinating but also you know listening to you talk about the economics of the cloud if you will it has so many features that are similar that are familiar to you from sort of the the economics of the silicon transistor. Yeah, you know, absolutely. As the right. price goes down, you you experience over decades this hugely elastic market and it's the I mean maybe it's the same phenomenon at different registers, levels of abstraction, but it's so similar, you yeah, know. It, you know, continues to sort of replicate those same model of, you know, hey, if I make computing a lot cheaper, I get to go do new algorithms. And the, the beauty of the cloud is you benefit from Moore's law, because you're putting you know, the, the latest processors in there with more cores, you know, clock rates, et cetera, you know, bigger memory footprints. But you also get to benefit from uh, the distributed nature, right? Because I now can assemble a thousand cores, right, for a few hours, and then I can disperse them. Right, you know, as well. So you not don't just get the right. I'll say the scale up characteristics. You also get the scale out characteristics of the cloud. So you actually get two dimensionalities, mm -hmm. right, uh, uh, working uh, for you when you go to the cloud. And clearly, you get it through this easy to access API portal, right. And now, as clouds are competing with each other on raw economics, right. You know, you got all these people figuring, oh, you know, I can tie them together better if I make the networks faster. Oh, I can tie them together better if I uh, use this. Nick offload, right? You know, I can tie them better together if I, you know, change my, you know, distribution algorithm. I, you know, so one by one, all you know, get all this engineering capacity, saying how can I really drive that competitive advantage of making more available more rapidly? You know, imagine 
uh, if you and I were, you know, we were in a corporate data center before, right? And somebody came running to us and says, you know, I got a great idea, right? I just need you to stitch a thousand GPUs into your data center and you can start running these machine learning algorithms. And I think you're going to be able to predict consumer behavior in your marketing programs more effectively than ever before, right? Now, imagine tomorrow you say, well, oh, it's a pretty good idea, right? You know, it's showing some promise. And I'm going to go to the CEO tomorrow and ask him for, you know, an extra 100 million of capital so I can put up the GPU farm so that I can do new marketing insights. How do you think that's going to go? Probably a hard conversation. Probably a hard <laughs> conversation. But now I get to go to the cloud and I say, hmm, let me try that experiment. And I'll rent the and I'll rent the thousand GPUs and combine it with the thousand cores I have. I'll run the experiments over the weekend. I'll produce some insights and I'll walk into the CEO's office and say, you know what? You know, I spent a few thousand bucks on my Amazon bill this weekend, right? I apologize, you know, take it out of my budget or my hide or so on like that. You know, here's the bill for ten thousand bucks. But here's the insight that I got from running those algorithms over the weekend. Let's give this a try, right, to market this way. Oh my gosh, right, I've changed the economic model from $100 million of capital, right, to, you know, overrunning my budget by 10,000 bucks this weekend and giving you, right, something in a few days. That is just changing our ability to leverage compute capacity. And that's really the thrilling aspect of, I'll call the superpower of the cloud. Could you tell us a little bit about um, forming that relationship with um, Amazon Web Services and some of the other kind of public cloud providers that you mentioned? You know, this I would imagine, you know, the, is a big deal. You know, if I'm thinking of it the right way, and please correct me if I'm not, you know, it's almost choosing like the operating system for your cloud. Yeah, yeah. So and that's a big choice. Can mm -hmm. you talk about how, you know, you've approached that? And, you know, the uh, Amazon partnership was one of those seminal, you know, sort of the shot heard around the world, right, sort of changing the cloud uh, industry as we partnered with them. And as I described it, five years ago, I stood on stage and said, if you used Amazon, right, you were stupid. And, uh, you know, Andy Jassy stood on stage and said, if you run your own data center, you're stupid. Right now we're on stage doing bro hugs and announcing a joint future together, right? <laughs> and you know it really has been you know one of those you know fairly significant changes for both uh, companies, and you know Amazon does not have this long and deep reputation for partnering, you know they're chewing up and destroying and disrupting industries, so as I uh, also described that we had the last and final board meeting on seven different occasions <laughs> to approve the strategy, right? Because it was sort of one of those, hmm, can I really bet on this partnership? How's that going to go? What's the future here? You know, what's the give and the gets? You know, how sustainable is that relationship? Are they really you're going to be in it for the long term? And, you know, you're going to throw hundreds of engineers at this partnership and, you know, go build that out. And it's worked out to be extremely positive for both companies. You know, there was just a big information article, uh, the information, you know, that yes. just was released uh, recently on, you know, hey, you know, the bet that the two companies paid is starting to produce dividends for both companies now. And, uh, you know, we really are seeing that momentum starting to emerge that, yeah, you know, the idea of the hybrid cloud, as we've already discussed, is a very merited, sustainable uh, strategy well into the future. And I'm also thinking about you know, in the move to VMware and thinking um, about the sort of people building the technologies in VMware versus the sort of people who were building the technologies when you were with Intel. Is it, um, is it, is it very different, you know, working in the software context versus working in the silicon context? Could you talk about the similarities and the differences and yeah, your software thoughts? versus silicon was a pretty, um, and you know, it was a pretty radical shift and you know, understanding and you know how those engineers work. And 
um, you know, uh, in a silicon project, you know, a major microprocessor, you have to get your uh, satisfaction on about five-year increments. Right. <laughs> right. You know, for you know, four for four years and three hundred and uh, sixty-four days, you're in the salt mines, and then you have one day of glory when you announce the chip, and then you go back into the salt mine. You know, for uh, five years. You know, it's a very, you know, boy, and you know, you build these teams. You know, and you know, a big microprocessor project now might be you know six or seven hundred. Uh, engineer, so you ramp it up over time. You got test people and fab people, and right, you know, package design and all this kind of things. And clearly, you know, by the time you release a new microprocessor, you might have had, you know, two, three thousand engineers touching it, right? You know, five years, thousands of engineers. Oh my gosh, right? You know, I mean, this is some of the largest scale engineering. You know, one time I had the. Uh, uh, the general, I think it was a two-star general who was in charge of the Joint Strike Fighter program uh, for the military come and talk to us about techniques used for large-scale engineering. Because you just don't find many projects that are of that scale, right? <laughs> you know, five years, thousands of engineers, right? You know, name all the projects at that level. Uh, you know, boy, you know, okay, we got airplanes, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, what else, right? There just aren't that many at that kind of scale. Now, a software project, hmm, you know, it might be four engineers as the nucleus, right? And they get a prototype running in three, four months, right? You know, particularly in, you know, very much in a uh, agile, cloud-driven microservices world, you know, the time scales are so dramatically different, right? You know, for, you know, thousands of engineers, five years, you know, five engineers for four months, right? Uh, and the type of talent uh, is very different, right? You know, hey, you know, in a silicon project, you know, you have a few I'll call prima donnas, you know, those core architecture uh, people at the center of it. But for the, you know, you need lots of execution machines, yeah. right? You know, people around uh, many different skill sets, very type of things. You know, a core software team can be very small in comparison, right? You know, and again, you know, it's not one, but boy, you know, as long as you get those four or five that can work together, okay, boom, you know, go for it, you know, right? Over here, it's like you're trying to create this distraction-free, focused environment, right, for them. Over here, everything's distraction, right? You know, have you worked on the packaging team? Well, what about the test team? You know, have you lined up, right, you know, the process thing? You know, is that, you know, you're always, you know, uh, you know working across all these different silos. So it's quite different uh, at that level. But there's also a lot of, I'll say, core engineering disciplines that serve you well, yeah. right? Uh, at that level where, you know, you, you really just, you know, dig deep into the technology, understanding how the systems work. And obviously big products get, you know, it isn't like four people forever, you know, projects get bigger over time. You have all sorts of other interconnectedness. You know, the core vSphere team today is probably five or 600 people, mm -hmm. but it's modularized into many uh, components as well. And I'll just say good engineering skills and disciplines work across any industry, <laughs> right? You know, they really do. And at the place like Intel, you learn good core engineering disciplines and uh, skills and how to program manage big projects and teams and organizations. And, you know, I just take great respect for all the learnings that I uh, got in my uh, decades at Intel. I wanted to ask you if you could um, talk a little bit about, uh, in more recent years, the whole uh, relationship between EMC and VMware and Dell. I have to admit, in that preparing for the interview, I was trying to parse out all of those moves, and it was very complicated, and I'm quite certain that I didn't understand it uh -huh. properly. So I thought maybe you could help us understand that. Yeah, so in um, you know 2012, I became CEO of VMware. Um, the storage company, EMC, yeah. right, and a few of the other businesses they had, you know, it was starting to flatline. Right? And uh, people were looking at, okay, where's the next phase of EMC? And uh, you know, so as you know, 15 is coming around and Joe Tucci is coming to the end of his tenure, right, as CEO, it's sort of like, what's next? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, EMC started to look at its options and uh, you know, essentially you know, a handful of options emerged. Right, one was spin off VMware and give give it to the shareholders, right? 
you know, it's going off pretty nicely. Another was we should merge with uh, HP, you know, maybe merge with Cisco, maybe merge with Dell, right? So a lot of turmoil, both of CEO transition, right, uh, as well as company transition. Yeah. So it was a very tumultuous time. Uh, I described it as the worst year of my life. Really? Um, you know, a variety of personal things going on as well. Um, you know, I'd broken my foot, uh, so I'm on a knee scooter and an invalid for a year, and as my right foot, I couldn't drive, so I'm being, uh, right, you know, rolling around everywhere. Um, I had a son who had cancer, uh, so he was going through treatments. He's, you know, uh, thank the Lord, he's uh, healthy now. Uh, we had two weddings. Uh, that summer, so That's hard. You know, right. Yeah, you know, I remember I was walking my uh, daughter uh, down the aisle with my broken foot, and as I describe it, this eye was tears of joy, and this one was tears of pain. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, the Dell EMC merger gets announced. The VMware stock cuts in half uh, through this uh, process. You know, uh, it's being described that I'm being fired. Right. Uh, and I'm going to emerge as the CEO of Dell, right? As this occurred, you know, so everything, right? You know, rumors I'm, you know, being spit out, we're going to be spun out, you know, I'm going to be uh, fired. You know, I was, uh, in fact, uh, sitting next to uh, Michael Dell at an event at the time, and one of the rumors comes out that I'm about to be fired. So I took my phone and I showed it to Michael, something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all this tumult is going on. You know, when the stock price is a CEO, it's sort of like your scorecard, mm -hmm. right, for everybody to see, right? You know, we're at half, we had a joint venture that collapsed, you know, so just huge tumult uh, in this period of time. And what out of that. What year was that? Uh, so this is uh, 16, uh, 15, 16, right? Uh, and out of that, uh, the merger gets announced, you know, it gets consummated, uh, and uh, we you know, essentially laid out a path to be leveraged, to leverage Dell, to remain independent, uh, and uh, to really uh, see the vision that we had been working on for several years start to be accelerated. And uh, so our low, uh, so we hit a low of $43 a share, not that I remember the exact number, but uh, $43.58 to be exact. Uh, and today we're trading at $188 a share, right? So, you know, over a two and a half year period, you know, we've seen an extraordinary acceleration of the uh, business. We saw accelerated growth rate and revenue. Uh, obviously the valuation, the new business areas, you know, Dell as a partner, is accelerating our growth rate as they're highly motivated to sell and bundle our products into their solutions. So, uh, you know, I uh, liked uh, the Ch uh, Churchill uh, quote, you know, when you're in hell, keep going, right? And it's sort of one of those things where you just sort of learn resilience uh, in those periods of time. Uh, one night I came home in the middle of that and uh, my wife looks at me and she says, you have become unlivable. <laughs> She was right. I had, you know, I was wound like, a, you know, a, a spring or, you know, a coiled snake. And, yeah. you know, it was a very uh, rough time. But now we're on the other side of that and, uh, you know, seeing extraordinary success. But you also learn, and I'll say again, a, a lot of this, I, uh, you know, look back on my uh, uh, Intel development and training where, you know, there's cyclicality in the semiconductor industry and, you know, boy, you have this harsh times and, you know, how to deal with having to lay off and restructure and, you know, you know none of those learnings, right, were wasted uh, in the process and getting the company through to the other side. And now we're enjoying extraordinary success as a public company, but with a majority shareholder named Dell, so independent, yet seeing great benefit to the interdependence. Right. Right. Uh, so, what percentage does Zell own? Eighty percent. So essentially, they have taken ownership of the EMC portion uh, right. in the. It, it uh, remained at that eighty percent. Yeah. yeah. And the other twenty percent is publicly held. Publicly traded. I hope you're a shareholder. You would have been well rewarded, right? You know, with one of the highest. I was just thinking that that yeah. I would have been if I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the highest total shareholder returns uh, over the last five years. 
right? You know, we uh, had a major uh, uh, special dividend uh, last year. So between dividends and stock appreciation, you know, we're now at like uh, 50% per year over the last uh, four years or so. So it doesn't get much better than that. So. Well, I thought... And more um, to come. Just to, <laughs> <laughs> um, unless there's, there's an aspect that we've, that, you know, we've missed about the, the VMware story that, um, you know, we, you think we should capture that I've missed. Um, I did want to talk to you a little bit about your life outside of work before oh, sure. we end the interview. But is there something that I missed? I think we've hit the big ones. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I wondered if you could, uh, you know, in preparing, I just saw, you know, some just amazing snippets <laughs> about your life outside of work. Uh, just a very active, like um, climbing Kilimanjaro, I think I saw. Mm -hmm. And also, I believe you're very involved with um, the creation of a school somewhere. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I was just, um, I'd love to hear about those, those other activities and interests that you're finding sure. time to pursue. Yeah, and um, you know, very uh, you know, early in my uh, Intel days, you know, uh, I became a Christian, uh, and that faith perspective has been central uh, to uh, character. And wrote a book, uh, you know, the Juggling Act, uh, balancing faith, family, and work, and really integrating those uh, together. So, you know, this idea that uh, uh, each of us has a higher purpose. Right, you know, well beyond our uh, day jobs, you know, is always just permeated, right? Uh, uh, me, my family, and uh, you know, I can show up for every day, and hey, I work for God, but uh, I'm happy to get a paycheck from VMware or Intel or whoever it uh, uh, was. So, you know, lots of charitable activities. Uh, you know, my wife and I uh, committed many, many years ago that we give an increasing percentage of our gross income to uh, philanthropy. And uh, so we made that commitment. We were giving away like 10%, and uh, now we're at close to 50%, right? And, uh, you know, it was 10% of nothing, you know, when I was a technician at uh, Intel, and now it's 50% of a CEO's salary. So, you know, it's a, it's a big number now. Um, and uh, one of the examples was the uh, work uh, in uh, Africa, uh, in uh, Nairobi, and uh, the uh, Kilimanjaro climb was a fundraiser for the schools uh, in Nairobi. And when we first started to work uh, there, it was a couple hundred kids, about 200 kids were in the schools in Nairobi. Uh, now it's over 17,000 kids are in 22 different schools in Nairobi. And the uh, statistics are exceptional, right? Uh, the mortality rate for the slum kids, and again, a lot of these are born of AIDS parents, and you know, just you know, extreme poverty, you know, well below a dollar a day kind of uh, uh, environments. That the mortality rate was 30 percent for the school kids. The kids in school is less than five percent, right? You know, 25 percent of these kids, right, wouldn't be alive. Uh, you know, because it's not just a school, it's also healthcare, right? Spiritual training, life training, and jobs training. The average uh, schools in Nairobi, 20% go to college, right? Most of those in the state schools. 40% of the kids from the schools go to college, right? So these are slum kids that are now having 2x the efficacy into graduate, you know, into uh, beyond high school education. Mm -hmm right, uh, uh, as well. One of those is in a second year at Stanford on an international scholarship. A slum kid born of two AIDS parents, raised by his grandmother in extreme poverty, right, in some of the darkest slums, is now in a second year at Stanford. Just extraordinary. So the uh, fundraiser, the Kilimanjaro Climb, was a fundraiser specifically for building a girls boarding high school. Okay. Girls are particularly susceptible to tribal patterns. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, a you know, 11, 12 year old girl, boy, you know, being raised by a uncle or a grandparent or something like that, hmm, you know, a tribal leader, maybe four cows, oh, maybe three cows and two camels. Okay, great. You know, she becomes the third, fourth, fifth wife. Uh, and being able to keep 
girls in particular uh, in school was the purpose of the uh, fundraising climb. So uh, we raised uh, you know about three hundred thousand dollars. So our goal was one hundred and seventy-five thousand, right? So we uh, you know. It's, I uh, never like to meet a goal. It's always beat a goal. Uh, and uh, so now there's a girls' high school that's going to open this fall as a boarding school just outside of Nairobi to keep girls uh, in school. Uh, and uh, quite excited about that. But, you know, it's also uh, we're looking to expand. Uh, my wife and I just, uh, uh, you know, we uh, are funding uh, building out uh, STEM education into all the 22 schools. Uh, so, you know, bringing, you know, being able to have, you know, science, technology, computing labs, et cetera, uh, into those environments. And uh, really, I'll say, you know, building, uh, you, know, you know, I call it building a city out of a slum, mm. right? You know, where you're building structure and infrastructure and uh, uh, capacity, you know, to see uh, these uh, kids emerge and uh, looking at uh, extending that to other com uh, countries. Uh, not just uh, Kenya and Nairobi, uh, but also some of the adjacent countries uh, in the air area, and uh, that and a variety of other philanthropies. But you know, we've had extraordinary uh, uh, impact. You know, way beyond you know what it might mean to be the uh, CEO of a great software company. Would you say that the, that system of schools has been w one of the areas you've concentrated in the most with your? your kind of philanthropy and service? It's certainly what, you know, as I say, we have, uh, you know, we're very involved with the schools in Nairobi, you know, visited often, you know, invested in those. So that's one of the big ones. We also uh, uh, work to create a church planting organization. That's now a national church planting organization. When we uh, started to partner with them, they just did work in California, doing a couple, three plants per year. Uh, now they're uh, this year they're going to do about 170 church plants, but also do ones in South America, where uh, working with compassion, uh, where uh, I call it a, a community in a box, where the compassion wants to sponsor kids, but they'll only do it where churches in the community to provide an infrastructure for the kids that are being sponsored. Yeah. So our church planting organization is partnering with Compassion to plant a church, sponsor kids, right, and transform communities, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so uh, a number of those in South America, Bolivia, Peru, uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, Colombia, right, are now participating in that uh, model. So U.S. church plants as well as South American sort of sister church plants as well. So that's another one. Uh, we've also been uh, super involved uh, with the uh, William Jessup University Christian Liberal Arts uh, uh, University where I was on the board for uh, many years uh, for that and really helping them to go from a little uh, school in San Jose to now uh, closing in on 2,000 students. Uh, at uh, William Jessup over in the uh, Sacramento Rockland uh, area, so super involved uh, with that one. Uh, we've also been uh, very involved with the Luis Palau Association, uh, the uh, you know uh, you know worldwide evangelism and ministries. So that's another one we've been very involved in. And then the final one is uh, and coming back to the Bay Area, uh, you know, felt that there was a higher purpose to come to the Bay, mm. and uh, the Bay Area. You know, four characteristics for the Bay. It is arguably the most influential area on Earth. Mm -hmm. It is the richest area on Earth as measured by per capita income. It is one of the least churched areas in the nation, right? One of the lowest rates of people attending church or church participation of any form. And it is one of the least philanthropic areas of the nation. I didn't realize that last yeah. one. So you have the richest that are not giving, right? The influential that are not based on, you know, a, a faith perspective in any way. So we started an organization uh, that I'm the chairman of called TBC, Transforming the Bay with Christ. Uh, and uh, it uh, has three missions. Uh, one is to unify the Christian leadership of the Bay Area. Right. Uh, second is to amplify works of service to the Bay, mm -hmm. and third is to multiply the churches of the Bay. Mm -hmm. 
So we started TBC, and now that's in its uh, fifth year, I think, at this point, uh, to uh, be this uh, influence uh, for uh, bringing uh, you know, transformation uh, to the uh, Bay Area and having great success. So those are the big five uh, ministries that we're uh, involved in, but you know, you know, very philanthropic. And uh, you know, one of the things I'm super proud of as CEO uh, of VMware is that uh, VMware you know, really has developed a, a reputation uh, as a company of being philanthropic, uh, giving back, uh, being uh, you know, a champion for tech as a force for good. Uh, you know, we have what we call our citizen philanthropy program as well that we're trying to make you know, all of our employees uh, citizen philanthropists. Right, and giving them, uh, you know, being the geeky culture we are, you know, every year we give multiples of pie dollars, right? <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, so last year it was 100 pie that we gave to employees that they could go invest in the charity of their choice. You know, we'll, uh, we'll match uh, hours, right, with 10 pie dollars. So every hour up to a certain, uh, you know, uh, level will match that, to, that you can contribute dollars to that for every hour that you contribute to that uh, mm -hmm. philanthropy. So, you know, and it could be, you know, Habitat for Humanity, it could be, you know, like, uh, tutoring in your local school, it, you know, could be uh, working, uh, uh, you know, we do what we call good gigs, right, which are, we'll assemble teams to go participate and, you know, give them time to go. And like uh, one of them, a couple of years ago, we uh, connected up, I think it was uh, 700 schools in the jungles of Malaysia became networked, right? And that was a good gig of a team that, you know, of like 50 people that we sent there to, right, go build out that. So, you know, lots of these kind of things. So my own values of philanthropy, giving back, uh, you know, investing in causes that are higher than yourself are well represented in the company. And those were, many of those were there before I got there, yeah. right? Many of these programs, but we've really been able to accentuate and extend them in uh, significant ways. Well, that's that's fantastic. It's tremendous. How did you get involved with Africa? Some of these others I can understand, but Yo, what was? One of our mission, one of our, uh, the people at the church that we went to mm -hmm. was a missionary there. And uh, so we became somewhat loosely associated with it. Uh, then we took our kids and visited the missionary friends in Africa. Mm -hmm. And then our hearts were stolen. Right, and we really, uh, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, once your heart's been moved to something like that, you know, and uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, different pictures singing, you know, where I'm, uh, I'm uh, lecturing and teaching uh, to a thousand boys in their school uniform. Right, remember these, uh, and these uh, kids, uh, you know, a school uniform. You might consider that in the U.S. Oh, that's so old school. Mm -hmm. For there, that might be the only nice set of clothes they have. Right, you know, and it's a it's a picture of dignity, mm -hmm. you know, for them to be able to do that. And uh, you know, boy, you know, kids screwing around in school here. Uh, you know, why do I need to do this over there? They realize that that might be the only opportunity they have to leave a life of squalor, mm -hmm. right? And their commitment to studying. Uh, and uh, you know, they'll uh, just come. You know, uh, you know, I got pictures of my wife where uh, you know maybe you know hundred little kids are, you know, just crowded around her, just wanting to touch her, mm -hmm. right, at that level. And, you know, you've been in a few of those experiences, right? And you sort of say, yeah, you know, what I do for my day job is good, but what it enables me to do, right, in my spare job, right, mm -hmm. is truly transformational and uh, touching lives for eternity. That's wonderful. Uh, so, sort of bringing us back from the philanthropic side to the more practical Bay Area thing, and that is the uh, s story of VMware and the Sanford uh, Industrial Park. Um, sort of what is what has been VMware's experience uh, in the industrial park? What you know is being there been of any value, impact, or mm -hmm. it was just a place to land? Uh, and what are your observations having? been there for a period of time in terms of the impact of the industrial park on companies like yourself? 
Yeah. And some of those, I'll say, you know, things I'm, you know, decisions were made and some of those were happening without me. So, sure. right, you know, there are probably a few others that can give better perspectives on that than I might be able to. But, you know, VMware, your typical startup company, it's trying to, you know, slavishly find anywhere to meet, right? <laughs> right. And its initial location was actually what's called the uh, uh, Cheese House, right? Uh, I think it's uh, Cheese House. Uh, anyway, you know, it was a little, you know, a couple of rooms on top of a uh, uh, restaurant, a uh, little uh, sandwich shop uh, sitting in the uh, uh, across the Embarcadero Mall, right, you know, and uh, so that was its first location, and then, you know, I grew that a couple of times, and then, you know, essentially its first permanent location was a few buildings at the end of the Stanford Business Park Triangle where it's located now, mm -hmm. right, and uh, so that became its sort of first place that it really landed as its uh, true home of scale. And uh, there, it's been this uh, phenomenal relationship. One is there's been a strong affinity to stay close to Stanford, mm -hmm. right? You know, be nearby. And I call it, hey, I just want to build a thoroughfare between us and Stanford. Mm -hmm. You know, I want our people going over there, lecturing, interaction. I want every bright, capable student to come our way. <laughs> you know, we do uh, different uh, research programs, uh, you know, fellowships, et cetera, you know, where we really see that ongoing vibrancy of ideas, innovation, talent, people, right, both in both directions uh, going back and forth. So the physical proximity is an important piece Absolutely, of absolutely. And, you know, to me, if you're more than a bicycle ride away, you're not effective, right? Mm -hmm. So being... You know, that uh, boy, you know, literally a uh, graduate student, uh, uh, you know, can be finishing finals on Friday and uh, on campus on Monday, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, boy, if they finish finals on uh, Tuesday morning, let's get them Tuesday afternoon, right? <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah, you really want that vibrancy of a relationship. And the business park has just worked out pretty fabulously for us because, you know, started as a couple of buildings and then became uh, six buildings. And then we took over some more property from SAP and then uh, Genentech Roach, right? Uh, you know, we had the opportunity to take over the rest of the campus. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a, a decision that was made just as I was becoming CEO. Right uh, for it, and uh, we uh, renegotiated all the leases on the uh, property there from the business park, and uh, you know established ourselves. I think we still have I think about 30 years left on our lease, mm -hmm. right with the Stanford Business Park. So you know my view is uh, you know if we can negotiate a hundred year lease, we'd go do it, mm -hmm. right? Because we really find you know that that proximity to Stanford, you know the location that we have is just exceptional. Right. If you come onto our campus, uh, you know I think the uh, Fortune Best Place to Work article described this as the Zen-like setting. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. Uh, you know. And I, I've always said when I when I drive onto Stanford, Stanford campus or go for a walk on Stanford campus, you know I feel better. Mm -hmm. Right. My blood pressure goes down. Mm -hmm. Right. You know my ability to think. Right. Goes up. Right. And the interactions that you get with the energy. Mm -hmm. Right. The creativity. And we want the VMware campus to be identical, mm -hmm. right? You know, people can show up there. So they're like, oh, I can relax here. Oh, come and eat my peanuts, right? You know, come and walk around the campus, our Redwood Walk or, you know, our alleyway or, right, our, uh, you know, areas that we have for, uh, you know, community to come together or come and see my turtle pond and, you know, just all these kind of things where people just feel like, oh, this is a place I can work. I can feel good. I can innovate here. And there are great people, right? And that's really that other uh, connection that, you know, if you're working on great problems, you have great people, you can attract great talent, you treat them well, and you have a very value-centric uh, culture, people will be here a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been able to create. And even as a worldwide company now, right, we're you know, 5,000 people in uh, Bangalore sites, and you know, our sites around the world, 1,000 people uh, in Atlanta, you know, probably 500 in each of uh, Seattle, uh, Boston, we're closing in on 1,000 in Sofia, Bulgaria. You know, there's no doubt that Palo Alto is the center of VMware, mm -hmm. right? It is, it has been, and it always will be in that campus setting. It's pretty How many people do you have there on the campus? Yeah, you know, we're closing in on 6,000, Okay. right? Uh, and uh, we just took a building across the street 
uh, as well. So I plan on keep building up the site. So every time something adjacent becomes available, we'll just keep spreading our tentacles out. Do, is there a feeling on the park that they want, don't want anybody like yourselves to get too big? Like they say, you've got enough, they want some diversity or whatever within the thing? Or what percentage of the total business park do you occupy? I don't even know. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, I'm not even sure what percentage we do represent. We've never had any pushback because mm -hmm. I think they have viewed us as great partners, mm -hmm. great tenants. Uh, we also have great relationship with Palo, the city of Palo Alto, mm -hmm. right? Where I think everybody sort of views it, this is good, let's do more of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one example, uh, one more little story on this that I absolutely uh, uh, love, um, I was, uh, walking by the office of my head of HR and uh, sitting there waiting for my head of HR was my head of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I go plopping in and, uh, you know, uh, sit down and, uh, you know, uh, uh, looked at her and I said, so we set a goal of being carbon neutral by 2020. Mm -hmm. She says, yeah. I says, what would it take to get that done like a lot faster? And she says, well, what do you mean? I says, like, let's get it done two years sooner, right? And, you know, and she's like, ah. <laughs> you know, and Nicole is having this, like, uh, sort of, you know, the CEO is just telling me how can I go a lot faster, right? You know, for the core of what she believes in with our sustainability program. So, uh, you know, and I'm, you know, this interaction lasts two minutes. I says, come back with a plan. I want you to come back and, you know, you know, break the envelope, you know, come up with some creative thinking, you know, because we've said our, one of our corporate mottos is innovate in everything, right? You know, not just in the R&D and the products. So out of that came uh, the program that we're now well underway and implementing called a community microgrid, hmm. where we're building out, you know, a large solar capability, large battery capability, uh, and the ability to be both, you know, generating more of our power locally, right? Storing it locally, but also becoming part of the grid for Palo Alto, mm -hmm. which is his own mini utility uh, for Palo Alto as well. So we can both receive as well as feedback. And the objective of working with the city of Palo Alto that will become a sustainable emergency response center as well, right? Where emergency happens, earthquake, yeah. you know, something like that, boom. You know, VMware's campus is not only, you know, cause you know you have power, Right, we're building more redundant communications and capacity uh, into it. We'll build out some, uh, you know, basic medical uh, capabilities as well. We'll, we'll become a emergency response center uh, for the city of Palo Alto. Right, so you know some of those kind of things. Right, and as you're doing projects like that, you know, where people sort of say, "Wow, the campus is beautiful. It's you know representing our community values. We're the source of innovation, and we're doing things that just make the community better." Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, yeah. We, we like you guys hanging around, right? Is there any interaction with any of the other companies in the industrial park? Uh, somewhat, right, uh, as well. But I don't, that, that's not the sort of center. The relationship with Stanford is the center. Right. Okay. Would you like to invite yeah. Matt to do? So we have a final request, and that is, uh, as you've probably seen on the wall downstairs, uh, we have this program where we ask innovators and entrepreneurs and venture capitalists like yourself to provide us one word of advice and that you would give to an entrepreneur starting off. And you write the word on the card, you sign your name to it, and we take your picture. Okay. And so you own that, that it becomes your word. And yes, there are duplicates and so forth, but everybody has their own uh -huh, uh -huh. flavor and taste and so forth on it. Some have, okay. uh, So can I give, a, you know, can I give a, 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 a two word answer? You can give a hyphenated. <laughs> yeah, we'll hyphenate it if we need to. <laughs> right, give. yeah, you can right. give a two word answer. I, yeah. Normally I would say no, but it, it, we've yeah. had a few, you know. Yeah, yeah, because I'll just say, the, the, yeah. you know, you know uh, the, the core of I, you know, who I've been, has always just been hard work. Right, I'll say what I lack in intelligence, I make up in hard work, mm -hmm. right? You know, one of my, you know, favorite, uh, you know, little, uh, my, uh, you know who Steve Prefontaine is? He was the Olympic middle distance runner from Oregon, mm -hmm. where we lived for many years. Mm -hmm. And he says, I may lose, but the other guy will bleed to beat me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right? And there's sort of this, you know, there's this grit aspect. And when you've been born and raised on a farm, you know, as I say, when I, when I, when I came to Intel, it was sort of like, hmm, no horses kicking me, no cows biting me, I'm not covered in sweaty hay dust at the end of the day. This is close to heaven. I just outworked everybody, right? You know, and uh, you know, why would I leave? I like to work, right? You know, right? You know, I, you know, uh, you know, showing up for milking time was, you know, before five o'clock, and uh, you know, if you quit before the sun went down, right, you were pretty lazy. So, uh, you know, just uh, so hard. Well, that's work. great. That's perfect. Yeah.